What is really fascinating about fiction is that sometimes it reveals something that is deeper than, than the truth. When you look at the last interview, it's, it's, this whole book is a confession, maybe a false confession, but it's a confession. There's a confession energy to it. It deals with what, what do stories reveal about our subconscious, not only of the writer, but also of the reader. Good morning, I'm Michal Jantowski on the Havel Channel. And it is my pleasure to greet the Israeli writer Eshkol Nevo. Good morning, Eshkol. Good morning. I have very uh, clear memories from the Václav Havel Library. I was there, uh, I think, more than a year ago. Uh, and I have uh, beautiful memories of Prague. And I wish I could be with you uh, today. Well, we wish the same. A year ago, you were here to discuss uh, uh, your novel Three Floors Up and uh, a year later just emerging from the lockdown here and you a bit earlier we meet online on Havel channel to speak about your latest book The Last Interview which is being published in Czech by the Pistorius and Olshanska publishers. So first of all uh, what shall we call this is obviously an interview Yet it can hardly be an interview because you already gave your last interview. So was it just the latest interview or uh, how, how, how shall we proceed? Uh, uh, you found a very uh, sophisticated way to uh, talking about this. Other, other uh, moderators I had regarding this book, they had a panic attack. They said, <laughs> what can I ask? Everything was already asked. Uh, so, but uh, but you you can relax. It's uh, it's just a character. It's a novel. Uh, it's maybe the last interview that the the character in the novel gave. But it's not. It wasn't my last interview. Uh, I'm I'm writing. I'm book touring uh, uh, through Zoom. So feel free. Okay, we will see about uh, all the questions having been asked. I have a a few. A couple more that uh, uh, may be relatively new because your book is not only a puzzle uh, but it seems to be an intentional puzzle on the Dichtung und Wahrheit uh, variety. So is it autobiography posing as fiction or fiction posing as autobiography or perhaps fiction posing as an autobiography posing as a fiction or autobiography posing as a fiction posing as an autobiography. My impression is that you want to keep us guessing. Uh, uh, it, it, uh, you make it sound uh, very, uh, very complex, but actually it, it was very simple. Uh, when, when I started writing, I, I was playing this game with myself, taking all the questions I'm asked uh, during interviews or readings and answering them in the most honest and uh, non-politically correct straightforward way and at, at the beginning it was autobiography uh, autobiographical uh, it started like a, like an autobiography but there was a point i understood that this game i was playing of questions and answers can become a, nov a novel and then i started uh, going beyond what really happened and writing what could have happened, uh, what I'm afraid that will happen, my passions, my fears. I, I tried to maintain a level, a high level of honesty. I would call it honest fiction. But even if I'm not writing uh, about uh, his, the historical truth, I'm writing about something that is in, 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 in a certain level is honest. Uh, so for me, it's a very honest book, but it's not definitely not auto autobiographical, and it's not uh, it's not the it's it's not a, a documentary book. It's it's a novel. It's fiction. Yes, well, it's it's one of the underlying themes of of the book in the uh, dialogues that the character. Uh, the main character has with his uh, wife is uh, as soon as autobiography becomes a fiction how can it 
can it be can it stay honest or when it's a fiction is it uh, it's it's a tale it's a uh... tale well it's it, it's it's uh, i think that you, this book is also uh, it's about many things but it's also about this line between truth truth lie fiction storytelling advertising uh, i think we live in a in a time where we have fake news and fake leaders and this quest for for honesty is is not only uh, one of the of the character or the writer it's also i think it's a quest of our time uh, the time that we are living in so i uh, I think if you, if you were talking about the writer's wife, the problem is that he, he's such a storyteller that he cannot even stop telling stories when he's talking with his wife. Uh, she does not know anymore what, is she hearing the truth or just a good story? And, and he, in a way, he loses her uh, confidence uh, and loses her support Trust. because he's telling stories all the time. He loses a trust, yes. Well, you, you, you keep teasing us in this way, yet at times you give the game away, or, 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 or almost. You can hardly disguise the real-life figure of your grandfather, but at the same time you relegate him to the margins of, of, of the story. And at the same time you give a rather prominent place to the best-selling Scandinavian thriller writer Axel Wolf, who apparently does not exist, or at least, or am I mistaken? No, no, he, he's, he's, a, he's, he's a fiction made out of at least two or three Scandinavian writers I met during a book touring. Yeah, I, I spent, uh, you know, maybe half an hour <laughs> looking for him on, on, on the internet, and there are uh, a few writers named Wolf, actually, uh, I wrote a thriller novel some 10 years ago, which uh, takes place in part in Jerusalem. And because I was uh, uh, the ambassador in Jerusalem in, in Tel Aviv at the time, I couldn't publish it under my own name. So I borrowed a name of my colleague. It was Daniel Wolf. So wow. <laughs> maybe I was writing about you. <laughs> No, I'm not. I'm no Axel. I'm no Axel. <laughs> uh, well, you seem to enjoy working with alternative identities and histories. Your narrator is a fiction not far removed from the reality. Some of his adventures, like the rather fatal love affair in Colombia, uh, seem to be fictional stories of a fictional character. Does it reflect your perspective of, of human mentality? Do we struggle with multiple, fluid, ever-changing identities which are all equally real, with stories which are alternatives of our stories in the way that, uh, uh, that Borges describes them in, in the garden with the forking pass? Uh, or do we invent new identities to protect, to hide, transcend our real identities? Everything that you said is, is, uh, is fascinating. Uh, I think, you know, you know how, how did I start, uh, when, when did I understand that, that maybe I would want to be a, a writer? There's, there's an answer in the book, but there's another answer, which, which is connected to my... Uh, backpacking in in, in, in South, America. South America, and I, I was writing letters to my girlfriend, and and at the beginning I wrote uh, I wrote her letters about what really happened in my trip. Uh, she was in Israel, uh, but then at one point I started going from uh, from nonfiction to fiction. I started inventing stuff, um, telling her things that did not really happen in my in my uh, traveling. Uh, because nothing, sometimes you just, n nothing happens, but I wanted to write. So I think that I was 24, 25, and, and that was the moment I understood that maybe I want to be a professional liar. Um, now, of course, I think what is really fascinating about fiction is that sometimes it reveals 
something that is deeper than than the truth uh, I think when you think think of a dream uh, there, there are a couple of dreams in the book the dreams of the of his wife his own dreams think of the idea of a dream we have night dreams and they are not our reality but they are based on things that happened and if I would tell you the dream I dreamt last night it would be extremely foreign intimate even though it didn't happen why because the dream reveals something which is deeper than what is the historical truth and this is why I write fiction and I do not write a, a biographies uh, I would I think I would never write uh, um, I tried I tried to write about an, an historical event as it happened but I I, immediately I felt the need to change it and the need to, to, to tell a story about it, which was not exactly what happened. So I think this is why I'm attracted uh, to, to fiction. This is what fiction can give us. It can give, uh, let us go beyond our, our conscience and maybe deeper into our un- unconscious. Okay, so we talking here about the consciousness and unconsciousness and subconsciousness. Uh, this uh, sounds quite Freudian. Well, we are actually both uh, psychologists by training, and uh, although we are practicing other traits, but uh, it's sometimes said that being a psychologist is like being a, a rabbi or a priest that you can never really stop being one. So how... <laughs> How important is the psychological perspective to you? Is it more of a help or a burden? Um, first of all, I must, I must uh, admit uh, that I, I, I study psychology. I was never a real psychologist. I, there was a point in my life I had to choose whether to, to be trained as a psychologist or to finish my first novel. So, and I chose to be a writer. Uh, but my, two of my, my, my parents, my father and my mother, they said they are psychologists. I grew up. In our house there were house. All, all the all the books of Freud were were in the living room uh, all he all his books from from the first one to, to his last one that translated to Hebrew so this is the kind of stuff I read I read the meaning of dreams when I was 10 um, so so it's in my blood and and if you think of uh, trepiani the three floors um, sure you The, the, the Freudian model is very central there and I think every book when, 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 when you look at uh, the, this, this line this line of books uh, that I've written there's a connection sometimes I only see the connection when I when I um, when I have pers- uh, perspective uh, and now the last interview was published in uh, Two and a half years ago in Israel so I, I think I can I can now see the connection because three floors had the, the, the topographic model of Freud that was the structure of the book mm-hmm. and and there were confessions in this book and and when you look at the last interview it's it's this whole book is a confession maybe a false confession but it's a confession that there's a confession energy to it and it deals with what 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 Do stories reveal about our subconscious not only f- of the writer but also of the reader you know that's what's really important once the book is published what is really important is what what happened to you as a right as a reader when you when you read my book what it what areas of your soul were touched what what did it remind you what answers would you answer if you had this questionnaire what what would you answer if, if you were asked a uh, Uh, what do you regret in life when, when was the last time you cried um, which moment of your life would you want to live again I think the book begins to be really interesting when the when the reader is involved and he answers the questions himself in his mind then there's a connection between the writer and the reader so it's not only literature as storytelling it's also you in part literature as therapy um, I think literature has a connection um, I, 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 I think you know there's this, the fourth wall in theater you talk about the fourth wall sure uh, 
And in, in a way, this book is an attempt to break the fourth wall between the, re- the writer and the reader. Okay, let's, let's not play games anymore. Okay, let's be together here. I, I, ask me questions, I will answer, then you will answer the questions yourself. So one of the most beautiful phenomena that happened with this book um, in Israel, in Italy, people took it very personally. They felt that the book is honest, so they also want to be honest. And then they started sending me emails with their own answers yeah. to, the, yeah. to the questions yeah. of the book. Yeah. Uh, and, and actually, it's happened until this day. Now, I, I got last night, I got an email from someone in the United States that read the book and, and, and wrote me this long email with a with couple of answers to the questions. So, so I'm thinking about connection. I, I don't know, that every, you know, every book is therapeutic in a way, but I, this book specifically, I'm thinking about connection a crave uh, for intimacy, maybe. Well, no, no, you're right. I mean, I there is a special sense of intimacy in the book, and I, I felt it when I uh, when I was reading it too. But if you going to receive more emails and more questions, you can just continue writing. You can write a sequel to to the last interview. <laughs> Seriously, I'm I, the, the, the 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 questions I'm getting are so beautiful. I'm I'm actually uh, considering a sequel, but but not now. Let's wait. Uh, okay. You know okay. my favorite my favorite film sequel. I don't know if you know it. Uh, um, it's called Before Sunrise, Before Sunset, Before yeah. Midnight. Yeah, yeah. And between every movie uh, with Ethan Hawke and uh, Julie Delphi, the director is uh, Linklater, American, uh, they had nine years. So may, I will do a, maybe I will do a sequel, but only nine years from now, different All perspective right. on life. Now, a little bit more seriously, the, the basic mood of your story is, is tragic, uh, a feeling of the unavoidable ultimate defeat of integrity, of love, of life. Dystemia is what you call it, a, a permanent state of mind of the narrator. But there is also humor in your storytelling, a sense of absurdity. Is humor for you the last resort, the survival device in the time-honored Jewish tradition or a mitigating circumstance? How important is it in your passion life? Ah, what a beautiful question. Uh, I'm just, I'm sitting here and enjoying uh, because you really captured the soul of the book. It's my saddest book and it's my funniest book and it, and it goes together and it's very Jewish. You're right. Um, and Jewish people have developed a sense of humor to cope with all the, all the tragedies this, this, uh, these people had to go through. And um, yes, it's that my ma- I, I was talking about my, my father and my mother. My mother, her PhD was about uh, humor. Mm-hmm. And uh, she found a very fascinating connection between the type of humor that uh, Jewish people um, use in, in, in the diaspora and also used uh, at the beginning of the century, and the type of humor that Israeli Arabs use now in Israel, because now they are the minority, the same way that the Jewish people were the minority in the European countries. So she found similarities, fascinating similarities, uh, like the same joke rewritten uh, and used by, 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 by Arab Israelis. So this was her PhD, and this is the kind of house I grew up in. By the way, my mother can't tell a joke mm-hmm. without ruining it. <laughs> okay, that we we know we all know people like that. Yeah, <laughs> she's a professional. She she every every good joke she can she can make a disaster out of it. So definitely, it's it's um. I think I was lucky. I was lucky to have this kind of atmosphere in our house, and also, I think uh, my friends have influ- influenced me. Um, I was lucky to have friends with with, with, a, with a great sense of humor. And it's, you know, now we are living in this crazy time of of Corona, of the pandemic. What what you know? What do we have besides humor? 
we are in, we, you just came out of the lockdown. We had two lockdowns already. Every normal aspect of life is, is, has changed. So what else can you do besides laugh about it? You know, it's, yeah. it's the only way. And, you know, coming back to the book, yes, it's, it's the, the, the main character is in a really uh, bad time in his life. His wife is going to leave him. His best friend is dying. His daughter is not talking to him. And, but, but what, what else could, could he do besides tell stories and, and find the humoristic, humoristic aspect, even in the most saddest moments? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, no, no, these are crazy times, no doubt about that. It's the same here. We've had two lockdowns. Uh, we're just emerging from the latest, uh, so, and all you can do is laugh about it. But uh, uh, you, you have answered my, my next question. Uh, this tragic perspective spiced with humor is something you seem to have in common with the generation of great Israeli writers, little older than you, Amos Oz, uh, A.B. Joshua, David Grossman. Uh, does this stem from a common experience of life in Israel, or does it have all the roots in Jewish history and, and, and literature and thinking? I, I, I think it runs in our blood. It really runs in our blood. And, and also, if you think of humor, it's what, what, what let's take the most, I think the most funniest story in the book uh, is the, the writer is given uh, a present while book touring, uh, a book of a, of a Holocaust survivor, Marcus Rosner is the name. Yeah. And this biography, which is huge, it's 950 pages, it's huge. He, it's, it's so huge he can't he can't get it in to his suitcase when he tries to move to his another his his next reading. So he tries to get rid of it, but he can't get rid of it. Every time that he tries to get rid of this, they bring it back. Yeah. Comes back at him, <laughs> it, and, and you know, let I, I let the readers discover how absurd does it get. But and all of this story comes as an answer to the question why aren't you writing about the Holocaust? So, because how else can I write about it? You know, it's, it's the only way I can, I can address this huge tragedy. Um, and, and also the question of Jewish identity and what does it mean for an Israeli uh, to, to be Jewish? Uh, I couldn't write about it in, a, in, in another way, but in an absurd way. It's, it's the only way I can, I can address this subject. Yes, uh, and and you wrote about it in a in a fascinating way, and uh, and you know in this part of Europe, as I'm sure you know, I mean the feeling of absurdity is is as deep as uh, it is in the Jewish tradition. Sometimes we call this country absurdistan. And, uh, and it, uh, it always proves the point. But I'm afraid we have to stop on this note and uh, thank you very much. We have heard from the Israeli writer Eshkol Nevo, whose latest book, The Last Interview, which makes, and I mean it for a fascinating reading, and thank you for that, Eshkol, is uh, just being published in Czech. So, Thank you. I, I, I must say, uh, I, I must give you a compliment. And you know, Israelis, we don't, we, we, we only give honest compliments. We don't have the, the manners to fake it. And I spent six years living in Israel, so I know. You know, you know, okay, <laughs> so you know what I'm talking about. This, this isn't my first interview about the last interview, but I, it, it was quite an experience to have uh, to have questions for someone who has read the book so deeply and so seriously and i feel maybe i found my ideal reader in prague and i hope to to see you and to see every every other czech uh, reader of mine as soon as possible as soon as we get the vaccine yeah you have to come back uh, you have a standing invitation to the vaslav havel library thank you this is Michal Jantowski on the Havel channel. Thank you very much.